What is up, you guys? Teller checking in for UFC Brazil. We're headed down to Sao Paulo, Brazil, to be exact. And if you're a fan of Brazilian mixed martial arts, uh, this is a card for you. Now, it's a little different than, than some of the past events that have taken place in Brazil. I'm going to explain to you why that is. Uh, this is a card you know, that the UFC put together where they're definitely looking for, for some of the up-and-coming talent out of Brazil to really solidify their, their, their names in the game. Uh, they're looking for some of these fighters to really take that next step. Uh, of course, you have Jelton Almeida uh, leading the pack. He's headlining this card, fighting Derek Lewis. If he gets a victory here, uh, he, he's really going to start to get some respect and push his way towards eventually fighting for a title. You guys know Tom Aspinall is now taking on Sergey Pavlovich for the interim heavyweight title. Uh, that division starting to opening, starting to open up. We don't really know what's next for John Jones. Stipe Miocic is a full-time firefighter these days. And um, Jelton Almeida, one of the more uh, respected names on this card. Uh, you also have a, 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 an old school Zaleski Dos Santos. He's been around for a long time. But other than that, this entire card is filled with uh, green Brazilian talent. Uh, you know, fighters that really have a lot more to prove. The, the Bonfim brothers, they are very promising. Uh, Kyle Bahio, you know, he is an absolute stud. He needs to to get a couple more big, impactful wins in the cage to really solidify his name in the game. Um, you know, we can go to the prelims too. I mean, you got all the, these talented up and comers. Elvis Brenner, this kid is su such a stud, constantly overachieves in the cage, still so young. Uh, I think I think he has a promising career ahead of him. Vitor Petrino, a knockout artist that's shown to be able to wrestle. Denise Gomes has been looking good. Uh, so you just understand that this is a card where the UFC is really hoping that, that some of these fighters can start to uh, carve their name out in the game. You know, when you think about some of the other events that have taken place in Brazil, right, like UFC 198, uh, you know, th these were the types of events that would take place in Brazil. You were always going to have these the, these legends, right, Fabricio Verdum, Jacare Souza, uh, even uh, Cyborg, uh, Shogun Hua, Damian Maia. All those fighters uh, that, that I just listed uh, are, are no longer fighting in the octagon. Uh, their days are way behind them, and the UFC needs uh, some, some of these fighters to burst onto the scene now and really represent Brazil in a major way. So I think it's a very exciting card when you think about it like that. You know all these fighters deliver. They're, they're extremely exciting. And uh, I, I just wanted to kick this video off kind of emphasizing that, all right? So you guys know how we do it here. We're gonna jump into the first fight here in a second. If you guys can, please like this video at the very least. If not, subscribe, it means a lot to me. Catch me on all my social media. I'm on Instagram at MMAFortuneTeller underscore, and I'm on Twitter slash X, they call it X nowadays, at The MMA Teller. And real quick, I'll say one last thing. Uh, we've been tearing it up as far as the, as the betting goes, okay? We had two max unit plays. Uh, on the, the last card that took place. Uh, if you guys check the recap there, you guys can see how that all went. Essentially, we had the clean sweep. Of course, we had some, some no contests and intertwined in some of those bets, but all in all, over the last three months, we've been killing it, okay? So things have been very smooth, and I expect that to cruise right into this card. So if you want to work with me, don't be shy to shoot me an email or a DM on Instagram or Twitter. It's all scrolling below. All right, guys, we'll have timestamps here for you, and I want to let you guys know I appreciate all of you all right, before we jump into this first fight. All right, with that, with that all being said, let's go talk some, some fight action. Uh -huh. Welcome to the show, this is the MMA fortune teller. Yeah. The MMA fortune teller. The teller. The teller. The teller. The teller. The teller. The teller. Kicking the card off, we have a UFC newcomer, Kawi Fernandez, taking on Mark Casey. You guys know I always have a little something to say about Mark Casey. I'll try not to be too harsh uh, in regards to him this time around. But first and foremost, let's talk about this kid, Fernandez, uh, who is uh, fighting out of uh, Team Nova Uniao, which you guys know is is pretty much the cream of the crop, at least uh, you know o over the long haul. They've been the cream of the crop as far as uh, Brazilian gyms go. Uh, Andre Petneris, uh, an absolute G in the game. And, uh, you know, from, from what I'm seeing, Fernandez has been training with them for some time. I've seen some pictures of him training with Jose Aldo uh, back when he was just a very young kid. At least he looked like like he was a kid there. Now, one thing that's a little frustrating here is I haven't have not been able to uh, get the age of Fernandez. If any of you guys can pull that up, I've looked pretty much everywhere. I can't pull it up. And I'm, I'm pretty interested to, to know how old he is. I think that is uh, is a big factor going into this fight. 
you know, so he he's making his UFC debut. He has nine pro fights under his belt. He made his pro debut back in 2013, 10 years ago. I'm curious to know how old he was when he made that debut. Uh, but he's been looking very good as of recently. He's been fighting over an LFA, and uh, he's been knocking dudes out, and he's been using his legs to get it done. He's been throwing some nasty, nasty kicks, and his last fight had that first-round knockout within 45 seconds. You guys can pull that up on YouTube, or, or you can at least pull it up on his IG, pull that up. And, uh, I mean, the, the way that he was in the clinch and just broke off and then whipped his leg up there and, and hit Felipe Douglas with the head kick was nasty. It shows you how dangerous uh, his kicking game is. He's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt, so you know his ground game is going to be pretty good, uh, to say the least. You know, we'll see how it holds up in the octagon in an actual MMA fight, uh, but... He seems to be a well-rounded fighter. Also, you take a look at his one loss against Luan Sardinia. Uh, that's the, Luan is an undefeated fighter. Uh, okay, so just understand that as well. He's 7-0 and uh, hasn't fought since 2021. It's been a little bit of a, a layoff for him, but he's an undefeated fighter to say the least. So it's not like a major blemish on his resume as of right now. And... Um, so, you know, here's the thing, right? So I, I said I wouldn't talk too much shit about Dia Casey. Dia Casey's 30 years old. To quickly sum him up, if you don't remember how he he what he's all about, he bursted in the scene in the UFC being a knockout artist, being a, a you know, a striker. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, as of recently, he he's over the last four or five fights, he turned into a complete grappler. And it made sense, you know, when he was going in there taking on a guy like uh Demir, uh, excuse me, uh, we'll start off with Slava Borshev, Slava Klaus. It made sense there. We know that. People were questioning Slava's uh, grappling and whatnot, and he was able to exploit that. Then he goes in there against Demir Hasnovic, does the same thing. And just really in general, I feel like he's just not been willing to entertain just a, a solid slugfest on the feet. So uh, it's not the most appealing to us as fans. And uh, also, it doesn't always look good for, for the judges too when it goes to the scorecards. If he struggles to get this fight down to the mat, I, I think that he could be in some trouble. Now, he still has that striking in his back pocket. I know he didn't just completely lose it. We've seen him have some big knockouts like back in the day uh, when he knocked out Timo Paklin. Uh, kind of a slouch, but still. We know he has that in his back pocket to potentially pull out. But I'm going to say the UFC newcomer comes out here and uh, is able to keep this fight standing for the most part and will get the better of the striking exchanges. I expect him to land some big kicks. And uh, he looks to be an absolute stud uh, physically. I think he comes in in, in phenomenal shape and... Uh, I don't have an age for him, but I think that he's probably, I, hopefully I don't sound like a fool for saying this. I think he's like 28, 29 years old, maybe 27 to 29. I think he's a young, hungry lion that's going to come in here and get a W in his home country. All right. So I'm taking Fernandez actually to get the job done. We're, we're taking the dog uh, right, right off the rip here. Um, on Jazz Sports, Fernandez opened up as a plus 150 underdog. Uh, we see him hit 166. It starts dipping the other way now. Actually touched a plus 137. So action was steadily coming in on him. Bounced back to a 164. Uh, and then went all the way, uh, almost to, to even odds there. He was a very, very slight dog. And right now, as I'm filming this uh, Wednesday... Uh, Wednesday, but now remember this fight's not taking place this upcoming weekend, so I'm a little bit a ways out from the fights here. But he is right around a plus 130 dog or whatnot. Uh, we'll keep an eye on this line, but I like any type of dog odds on him here. Now there is definitely some question marks and some unknowns, but if I'm gonna have to uh, bet on a fighter here with the information that I, that I have altogether, I like the dog odds on Fernandez. Uh, I think this fight maybe should be. Uh, more like a pick em from from what I'm putting all together here. We'll see. Uh, also, keep in mind, Dia Casey just loses uh, to Michael Johnson uh, as of recently. And I also want to mention that he also just lost to uh, Joel Alvarez, where he started off pretty good, but then eventually was submitted in that fight as well. Uh, maybe Fernandez can pull out some BJJ and, and pull off a sub later in this fight as well. Uh, so, uh, yes, give me the dog here. And, of, of course, I'm feeling that there's more value on the underdog line. Uh, on him there. I think that he prepares with some of the best fighters in the game, so he should be uh, up to the task for, for this debut. I don't think he'll have too much octagon jitters uh, with some of the guys that he surrounds himself with. In the women's strawweight division, we have the Mexican Montserrat Ruiz taking on the Brazilian Eduardo Mora. Eduardo Mora just very recently had a huge victory on Dana White's Contender Series where she went out there and dominated the opposition. Uh, the fighter that she fought was undefeated, uh, her name was uh, Janene Silva, went out there, uh, submitted her in the first round. And the way that she went out there and did it uh, is what made it so impressive. If you guys remember the way that that fight kicked off, just instantly shot on her uh, and just ripped her, ripped her down to the mat like she was just a little kid. I thought that that was very impressive. 
uh, just with the timing that she had in there and the way that she set that takedown up. She obviously has some nasty submission skills as well. Uh, she's 9-0 and as a pro. She has five submission victories. More than half of her, her victories coming by way of submission. Also has three knockouts. Uh, I, I think that she will get the better of the striking exchanges against Ruiz. Ruiz has never really impressed me that much with her, her striking. Now, everybody always remembers that that big victory that she had against uh, Cheyenne Vlismus. She kept just, uh, you know, kind of cheat code in that, that arm, the head and arm throw, and just kept get, getting uh, Vlismus down to the mat, kind of in that, that bully choke there and kind of holding her down on the mat. And, uh, you know, that's not going to work on Mora. I, I'd be extremely, extremely surprised if she was able to even pull that off one time, uh, let alone hold Mora down uh, on the mat. I think that Mora is going to be way too physical for her. She has the wrestling skills as well. I think that Mora is going to be better anywhere this fight goes. Uh, I, I really do. I think that Mora is the real deal. Uh, you see her toss some weight around and, and stuff on her IG. She's very physically fit, but understand that she's also very technical. All right. I, I liked what I've seen from her from a technical standpoint, and I think that she is the superior fighter here. Um, you know, we can go take a look at, at the betting line and see what we're talking about here. You know, Eduardo Eduarda Mora uh, is as high as a minus four eighty five. Uh, on Jazz Sports right now, she is a minus minus 450, essentially. Opened up as a minus 400, essentially. Uh, some movement there. Uh, let, let's take a look at what uh, uh, Bet Online's talking about. On Bet Online, she opened up as a minus 750, and it came all the way down to a minus 420. So just to make you uh, kind of be wary, even as high as a favorite as she's opening up as on some of these books, people really respecting her game. And, and I wouldn't... Be too discouraged with the fact that you see action coming the other way there. I mean, that's just an extremely high line. This is a women's strawweight match. You have to understand that a minus 750 line might, might be a little bit uh, ridiculous there, uh, but maybe not that far off. I don't know. I don't have no problem with any of these lines from the minus 400 to 500 range. I think she goes out there and gets the job done. I'd be interesting. Or I'd be interested to see if she goes uh, to to the wrestling much and tries to get this fight down to the mat, or if she tries to use her striking and uh, handle business there. Um, you know, as far as the reach advantage goes, check this out. She will have a six, uh, a, a six inch reach advantage, adva excuse me there, a six inch reach advantage on the feet. A little bit of a tongue twister there for me. Um, she's also about six inches taller. All right. So she's much more lengthy. She's much more skillful. Uh, that all being said, I will just throw out there. Ruiz is, is she's a tough chick, uh, but I, I just, I'm not completely sold on her. Uh, her her last couple losses, uh, also take note, she was knocked out in both of them. Knocked out against Amanda Lamoche and knocked out against Jacqueline Amorum. So uh, I'm interested if Mora looks to test the chin there or looks to go for the submission down on the mat. And maybe Ruiz welcomes those types of grappling scrambles and whatnot. Um, you know, you, you could definitely, uh, possibly for, for a women's strawweight bout, you could possibly see that under or that first round finish. I think there's some potential for something to play out like that, or maybe even a later finish. Uh, but the point I'm going is going with is, is that you may see a finish in this fight, which isn't always typical for, for a women's strawweight match. But I think Moore is a finisher. She has proven that now, again, with uh, eight of her nine victories coming by way of finish. Over to the featherweight division, we have Lucas Alexander taking on David Anima. Now, David Anima, you know, let's talk about him here for a second. David Anima has been in my good graces before. I was actually uh, really starting to gravitate gravitate towards him uh, after I had an official play on him uh, against, uh, it was, I think it was against Gabriel Benitez, uh, the hard-hitting southpaw there, the, the hard-hitting Mexican fighter. Uh, you know, I was actually at the Hard Rock in Hollywood, South Florida. At the time, I was in the elevator watching that fight. I was going nuts. I had two plays on Anima actually to also get a KO. I had a prop KO on him as well, as far as as well as the money line. So when he when he hit that that victory there, if you guys remember, that was a wild fight. I was jumping up and down in the elevator. I kid you not. As that fight ends, the doors are opened up. People look at me like I'm crazy. Uh, but you know, Anima, he was really in my good graces, and and I'm really high in his skill set. But you guys know, I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna BS you guys. I was not happy about the way things played out with him in his last fight. First off, I'll be honest as well. I had an official play uh, on his opponent. Um, I'm just trying to remember actually if it was an official play, but I know I definitely had some money uh, on his opponent uh, to say the least. Um, you guys know I have a little bit of action inter intertwined in every fight. It's just that my my official plays are the ones I really stand behind and where I put up a good amount of money. Anyways. Uh, I was backing Gabriel Santos. Gabriel Santos was looking great early on in that fight. 
And, uh, you know, the way that Anima fought that fight, he, you know, he he didn't gain any anything less than more respect for me. I thought the way he fought the fight was amazing. I just did not like the way that he uh, finished that fight up by pulling out the arrows, which you guys know I'm not really an Izzy guy also. So that, that kind of had something to do with it. But I thought it was just, just, I don't know, man, somewhat disrespectful. I don't know. I mean, I, it is what it is. I mean, he won the fight. He deserved to do it. I'm sure emotions were riding extremely high. The way that that fight was back and forth. And then he finally hit, the, hit him with that knockout. But besides all that, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to get in my feelings because some of you guys don't really care to hear about that stuff. Who cares? David Anima in that fight, to me, showed that he is a very, very dangerous opponent because he can do it all. He can strike. He can grapple. And uh, the real X factor that he showed is that he's extremely tough. And if, if you want to go to war with him, uh, he can dig very, very deep and, and prevail late in fights. So his, his stock, as far as a fighter, got, went way up after that fight. And especially when you understand who he did that against, that kid is extremely talented. And you know now that he's taking on another Brazilian fighter, uh, Lucas Alexander looked good in his last fight. Uh, you know, good good movement, nice nice calf kicks, nice leg kicks. You know, good speed out there on the feet. But he he won a unanimous decision against Stephen Peterson. I'm not high on him. It's harder to forget how he went out there and got submitted within seconds against Joe Anderson Brito, which I am very high on Brito. Uh, but the way that he got submitted so quick was a little bit alarming to me. He has two other questionable losses. Uh, that, that, that took place back in uh, 2017, 2018. Uh, I think that the kids does have potential. He's only 28 years old, so there's a lot of room for growth from those losses. And uh, I think that there's potential that he hangs in this fight, and it, it's an exciting fight. But I'm definitely backing David Anima uh, for the sheer fact that if things get get itchy in there, I know that David Anima will be comfortable and will welcome th that type of fight. And I could just see him uh, getting the job done in a variety of ways here. Uh, he's just, you know, especially... Via knockout too. If they if they want to go to war and slug it out, I could see uh, David Anima knocking Lucas Alexander out. Even though Alexander has never been knocked out before, he's been submitted twice. And I understand that Anima is not necessarily uh, some big time big time submission artist. Even though he has four subs uh, under his resume, that's a possibility too. But I think that this fight is gonna be a striking affair where I could see Anima landing some heavy shots. I think that he's really gonna be feeling himself as he enters the cage. He's gonna have a lot of confidence, and uh, I think Anima. I think Adam is a stud. So right now, uh, you know, you're looking at, we'll pull up Bovada.lv here. Uh, Anima opened up as a minus 220. A lot of scattered movement, but it's not really going anywhere. Uh, it only went to a minus 195 with all that movement back and forth. David Anima is essentially settling in as a, a two to one favorite. Um, you know, yeah, opened up as a minus 223 on Jazz Sports, dipped to a minus 202. Just understand right now, he's about a, a two to one favorite. Uh, do you want to, Chalk up two to one odds on him and, and a fight that could be a little bit of a barn burner type of affair. He's fighting a, a fighter that's, you know, going to have the crowd behind behind uh, him there. And and if the fight plays out closely, does he get robbed with the decision? You know, I'm not I'm not really certain. I want to take him right now. Two to one odds. Um, you know, if that line continues to dip and trend back down towards that path, continues that trend. If you can catch on him a minus 190, 180, I think that you're talking there. Uh, let's keep an eye on that line here. Uh, and if you don't mind chalking chalking uh, you know that that juice up then go for it because anima is a stud and at the end of the day i think he's gonna get his hand raised here in the straw weight division we have angela hill taking on denise gomes uh, angela hill what is there to say about her i mean i feel like we're talking about her all the time she's so active uh, although she is 15 and 13 uh, you also have to understand that she basically had her entire pro career take place in the octagon fighting the best women's mixed martial artists in the world, okay? You have to take that into consideration. Uh, Denise Gomes, only 23 years old. Uh, she's the girlfriend of Carol Rosa. Carol Rosa, uh, another uh, solid UFC fighter, a talented fighter. Uh, Denise Gomes is, is absolutely no joke. I mean, this girl obviously proved it in her last two fights, uh, but the, the victory that she had over Yasmin uh, Jaragi, that, that was the fight that really stood out to me because I'm extremely high on Yasmin. Yasmin is a nasty striker and she was able to go out there and knock her out within 20 seconds. Uh, you know, and, um, her, her, excuse me, not her UFC debut. She did drop a loss there to Loma, but after that, the way that she went out there, starts Bruno Brazil and essentially had her finished within the first round there. I mean, she has shown, uh, to, to be able to go out there and put it on her opposition very early on in fights. But let's not forget when she fought on Dana White's contender series, she also showcased that she can go to war for 15 minutes. She showed that she's an extremely tough fighter and, uh, 
I think that she's just a very promising fighter when you take into consideration that she's only 23 years old. I think there's so much room for growth here. Uh, on the other hand, Angela Hill is a very good fighter. She has been for a long time. She seems to always come up short in those big situations. She's coming off a loss to Mackenzie Dern. That was a main event uh, bout there. And once again, came up short in that that big that big situation. Uh, but but even besides that, that, that could just be a little bit of a coincidence just on the way some of those fights played out. It is the fight game. Anything can happen any night. Uh, but the one thing that you cannot doubt is the fact that Angela Hill is now uh, 38 years old, okay? The youth of Denise Gomes is going to be too much, I, I think, here. And, and I shouldn't say too much. Like, she's going to go out there and completely overwhelm her. There's potential she lands a big shot. I do think this fight plays out close, though. I want to say that. I think this fight plays out closely, but I'm taking the youth. I think the youth is the difference here. I think Gomes is going to have some some powerful shots landed. I think that she has some big moments throughout the fight, even if it goes to a decision, and she does enough uh, to take a decision. Um, now, is she going to go out there and, and knock Angela Hill out. I mean, Angela Hill has almost 30 professional fights and she's never been knocked out. So uh, good luck there. I mean, if Angela Hill loses, it's uh, vastly uh, via decision. And, and that's the route I'm going to go. I'm, I'm going to say Denise Gomes has some big moments, but actually edges out a decision victory. Okay. I've been a little bit back and forth with, with how I was going to go on this fight. I was target potentially targeting Angela Hill, but the more I dive into the tape and just uh, a couple other moving parts, again, I ex mainly because of the, of the youth and I expect Gomes to continue to grow and she's already looked very promising. So yes, give me uh, the, the young Brazilian fighter here. Let's we take a look at my bookie, and you notice that this line is is currently a very close one. Essentially, almost pick them odds, a very slight lean towards Denise's way. Uh, but you have to understand, uh, all all major books opened up Gomes as a a pretty hefty favorite. We see her opening up here as high as a minus one eighty one favorite on my bookie. Uh, all the other books had her opened up very highly, uh, and that line has just completely went the other way towards Angela Hill. I don't think I need to talk too much about that. I think you understand why uh, this is a a women's strawweight match, and, and Angela Hill has made a career of fighting in very closely contested matches. So why would you be chalking up a minus one eighty money line uh, on this young green fighter that still needs to prove a little bit more? I would say. Um, now, if you want to target Gomes at this minus 125 line, I don't have a problem with it. Uh, but if you were taking Angela Hill, I, I hope that you at least got on a little bit early and got some of that early value. Also, if you're looking to target Denise Gomes, maybe you monitor this line. Maybe you see that line continuing to trend towards Angela Hill's way uh, as we still have a good amount of days till this fight takes place. If that line continues to trend that way, maybe you get Gomes at like a plus 105 potentially. Uh, I don't know if that will be the case, but that would be great. Uh, if, you, if you can get that extra juice there. Uh, but give me Denise Gomes. I think that she wins a decision and she lands some big shots throughout this fight. And I think we start to see age finally catch up to to Angela Hill. Uh, nobody is, um, you know, no, nobody is able to avoid father time. I don't care how youthful you look and how good, uh, good of shape you're still in when you're 38. Eventually the game does catch up to you. And maybe that Mackenzie Dern fight was a sign of, of the beginnings of Angela Hill uh, starting to fall off the cliff as she's almost 40 years old at this point in time. Now, when you're talking about some of these up-and-coming Brazilian fighters eventually making a name in the game, I think Vitor Petrino is one of the top fighters on this card that has that type of potential. Only 26 years old. I mean, you, you take a look at some of the performances that he's had in the cage already. Uh, there's no doubting uh, just the raw ability he has. Obviously, he has knockout power. We saw that showcased on Dana White's Contender Series, which that victory aged very nicely uh, when you think about the fact, first off, that he has... Two knockout victories now against Rodolfo Bellato, and Bellato looked great as he just had a chance at redemption on Dana White's Contender Series and got the victory. All right, after that knockout win, went out there and had a decision victory over Anton Turkaj. I think that 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 fight as a decision victory actually proved a lot. Okay, because that fight the, the pace was grueling. Okay, it might have not have been the most exciting uh, fight, but they they were clinched up. There was a lot of wrestling exchanges, and Vitor Petrino showed that he can go late into fights and still have those, those bursts of energy. I think that he actually has good cardio, especially for a, a uh, an explosive, muscly type of dude, okay? I think that he really showcased something there. Uh, and then in his last fight, he goes out there, lands a bunch of big shots on Marcin Prachnio. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, we wanted to see him go out there and get the knockout. He was so close to doing it, but then eventually he pulls off a, a late submission as well. So I, I think he's checking off a lot of boxes. I think that he has so much potential. I'm very high on him. 
Uh, but with that all being said, I want to let you know right now, uh, I think that his opponent, Modestus Bukaskis, is a very good fighter. I think he's a very underrated fighter. And when you understand that he's 29 years old and that he he's just slowly, uh, you know, peaking and peaking to his prime, you're going to see a better and better version of him every time as well. And he's already showcased some good, uh, some good performances. You, you have to be a little bit wary. He's a dangerous dude. He throws heavy leg kicks. Uh, he, he can trade with you. He's extremely tough. Remember, he gets cut from the UFC after he takes a loss uh, to Khalil Roundtree. Remember when he had his leg hyperextended? That was a funky uh, funky strike there, and, and he he slipped up and he got caught with it. After that loss, though, goes out, uh, gets a victory over Lee Chadwick uh, over in Cage Warriors, then goes out there and knocks out Chuck Campbell in Cage Warriors, gets another opportunity to fight in the octagon, goes in as a big underdog against Tyson Pedro, wins that fight, goes out in his last fight, takes out Zach Payoga. You know, the, the, uh, Zach Payoga, a, a, a tough fighter, good striker. I mean, those are, are decent victories there. And um, I, I just think that you have to understand that Modestus Bukaskis is a very mentally tough dude. He's a, He has a large frame for the division. And uh, he, he's going to be sitting there in the cage Saturday uh, that, that Saturday night looking to, uh, to throw down. And he's going to be looking to get his hand raised. This isn't a guy that's going to be, um, you know, mentally weak and let the, the occasion take a hold of him. I, I really think that he'll be there. Uh, to throw down. But that being said, Vitor Petrino will just have too much firepower, in my opinion. I could see Vitor landing that big shot. I could see that knockout victory coming here. Um, again, again, we just talked about the methods of victory that he's had since signing uh, with the UFC. So he had a decision and a submission. I think it's time that, that Vitor Petrino gets that, that knockout TKO in the octagon. I mean, he's been doing that throughout his entire career. Just nine pro fights, but out of those nine pro fights, uh, two thirds of them, six via knockout. I think that we see one of those heavy hands land on um, Bukaskis as he's lacking a little bit defensively, a little sluggish, and he gets he gets capitalized on. And uh, I think we see a first or second round knockout, a little bit of an earlier knockout. Let's aim more towards a first round knockout, and and the Brazilian crowd goes crazy there. All right, so uh, Vitor Petrino right now he's a minus two seventy eight on my bookie. Uh, opened up right around that, dipped a little bit, but a two seventy eight. He's almost a three to one favorite on my bookie right now. Um, on Bavada, he's a minus 250. He opened as a minus 275 line trending the other way. Uh, so, so people understand that Modestus is, is a tough outing and, uh, is going to be a little bit of a step up in competition as well. This isn't a Marcin Prachnio. Okay. This isn't an Anton Tuka Turkaj. That's a little bit one dimensional. Uh, th this, this guy Modestus can do, do it all. And, uh, th this one might be a little bit more of a barn burner, uh, type of fight, but, uh, I think Vitor has the firepower. I like Vitor Petrino here to get that knockout. Um, you know, see what kind of prop line you can get on the finish here. Uh, but even if you want to just take him, take a money line. Uh, or maybe if you can get him under that minus two fifty line, more towards a two twenty, two thirty, that'd be obviously a much better line. So you you wait, see how that line uh, projects. But even if you want to take a minus two fifty, if you feel like you need action on this fight, I, I think Petrino you know, Petrino is the real deal. We have the fifteenth ranked welterweight fighter. Renat Fakradinov taking on Zaleski Dos Santos, uh, a longtime warrior. Uh, I mean, he's such a, such a crafty veteran. I think that Zaleski Dos Santos is one of the more slept on fighters in the game. Now, I'm not saying he, he was ever a fighter that was going to make a run at the title, uh, but, but when you talk about a legitimate fighter in the game that could do it all, that can go to war, has some underrated victories under his belt, when I mean, you're talking about a guy like Zaleski Dos Santos, and we, we can quickly go over that, but do understand that he's 36 years old now, and uh, whether he likes it or not, he's he's on the other the other end of the stick here, uh, coming off a split decision victory against Abu Abu Bakar Nurmagomedov, uh, and then he had a uh, an absolute war against Benoit Saint Denis, which that fight is a standout fight. We're going to circle back to that fight because that one is really standing out right now. Uh, a split decision loss to Muslim Salikov uh, was knocked out against the leash. That was one of the tougher losses he took, um, but went to war with Alexei Kuchenko, uh, knocked out Sean Strickland, the current UFC middleweight champion. He hit him with that that wild spinning kick, uh, knocked him out there. So you know that that's a victory that stands out so much. But he's just he's been around the game for a long time. Uh, dating back to uh, his UFC debut that was all the way in 2015, okay? So eight years later, uh, you know the victory over Omari Akhmedov, an underrated win, Lyman Good, Max Griffin. Um, you know, the thing the thing I like about him, he's a well-rounded fighter. He's extremely game. And I said I wanted to circle back to the, uh, uh, excuse me here, I wanted to circle back to that uh, Benoit St. Denis fight. I just want to say Benoit St. Denis has been on an absolute tear 
just went out there, knocked out Tiago Moises, submitted Ismail Bonfim, which we'll be talking about him in a second, knocked out Gabriel Miranda. Listen, ever since that loss that he took against Los Santos, he has been on a tear. He's on a, uh, a four-fight winning streak. Uh, taking out legitimate talent, I think that that just shows you what type of fighter Dos Santos is, that he was able to go out there and, and an absolute war and really get the better of St. Denis. He definitely took that fight. Even though St. Denis showed the toughness, Dos Santos was much, uh, much of a step ahead of him, way quicker to the, to the punch. And, um, you know, but now he's taking on Renat Fakhradinov, who's 32 years old. He's a primed fighter. Okay, a guy that has 24 professional fights, even though he's newer to the UFC, uh, no octagon jitters. This guy comes right in and just wreaks havoc. And, and again, I talked about Dos Santos having this lengthy career. He's 36 years old. I think that he's at a disadvantage right now uh, with the wear and tear. And I think they just have a much fresher fighter who's been putting work in over at American Top Team in, in Coconut Creek, uh, bouncing around at some of my old stomping grounds. I probably used to swing in this tree when I was a kid. Uh, I'm not even kidding you guys. I uh, used to see these trees once in a while where I used to live over there in South Florida. My grandma used to live over there in Boca. Probably used to swing on that tree. Uh, it looks familiar to me. Uh, you know, this was my childhood beach when I was a kid with the fam, man. I'd be right here. I kid you not, man. Me and the fam would be right there. I got old videos when I was a little kid sitting probably right where he's sitting. You know, so I always love to see that. Oh, and now he's at the Hard Rock Stadium watching my Dolphins play. Now, a little disappointing that he doesn't have a Tua Tagovailoa jersey. You know, I got mine uh, in all white. Uh, he's going to be the MVP of the league, and my Dolphins are going to win the Super Bowl this year. All right, but uh, you know, besides that, it's great to see him bump uh, bumping around the neighborhood over here. Uh, and, and on a more serious note, though, when these Russian fighters come down to South Florida and train at American Top Team, uh, you really see uh, th their game sharpen up even more so. And I think that it's a great move for him. He looked so damn good against Kevin Lee. I know Kevin Lee was coming off the long layoff, and he wasn't the Kevin Lee of the past. And and honestly, you could even say Kevin Lee was a little bit of an overrated fighter. I shouldn't say that, actually. I really shouldn't say that. When he was young, the potential he had, he, he was definitely on track to be a, a phenomenal fighter. But I think that, and I'm just guessing here, but I think that Kevin Lee got distracted and really didn't stay on track with his training because he had so much talent. But towards the end of his career, he really fell off. But still, the way that Fakhradinov went out there and, and finished him, uh, getting that submission there in under 55 seconds, but obviously hurting him too. Uh, I mean, that, that was phenomenal to, to go out there and dominate Brian Battle like he did. When you see what Brian Battle is doing time and time again, you understand how big of a victory that that was as well. Okay. Um, dominated my boy Andreas Michalaitis in, in his UFC debut as well. So people always hating on my boy Andreas, but Andreas really got matched up with some some tough fighters, man. People didn't fully understand who Fakhradinov is at the time, but really used his wrestling in that fight. I think he can go to the wrestling in this matchup if he wants to and, and play it safe and avoid the submissions uh, game of Dos Santos. I think he can can uh, take that safe route. But uh, even if he wants to strike with Zaleski, Zaleski's a very dangerous striker. I'm still favoring Renat Fakhradinov. I think Fakhradinov is the real deal, okay? Let me say that right now. I think he's the real deal, and I think he's one of the dark horses in the welterweight division that's going to cruise his way up towards the top, all right? He, he's a stud, okay? So uh, let's go take a look at the betting line see what we're talking about here. I think you guys know, obviously, I'm picking Fakhradinov to get the job done. And uh, he is a minus 310. On Bavada.lv, opened up as a minus 275. Actually, it goes the other way. He's a minus 260 uh, a couple of, uh, about 10 days ago. All right, and now he is a minus 310. So the line uh, going the other way now, which is really what I expected to see. I expected him to, to settle in. Uh, by the time this fight takes place, I expect him to settle in right around a minus 330, 340 favorite, maybe even a 350. I think action continues to come in on him. Uh, I don't care if he's fighting on enemy territory. I think the skill set... It's just going to be too much for, for, for Dos Santos there. Um, you know, Zaleski, uh, he's been knocked out only once in his 31 pro fights. He's been only subbed once. Uh, it's going to be hard for me to sit here and bank on Fakhradinov getting a finish, even though he's a bona fide finisher. Dos Santos is just so crafty and so tough. I'm taking a decision victory here for Renat Fakhradinov. We got a very tricky fight here. Daniel Marcos taking on Victor Hugo Silva in the bantamweight division. The fight's taking place. And we know that Victor Hugo Silva just fought uh, the other week, right? He had that very impressive knee bar uh, fight took place uh, on the 3rd of the month. So 22 days ago, as I'm recording this, just about three weeks ago, uh, by the time the fight takes place, it would have been, a, been about four weeks since he had that victory there over Eduardo Mateus Torres. Again, pulled off a beautiful knee bar. Uh, Victor 
Hugo Silva has continuously shown that he's very dangerous with attacking the legs. He pulls off all types of leg submissions. So that's going to be a threat that he brings in, into the cage when he faces off against Daniel Marcos. That's definitely an X factor. Okay. Um, now, when I, I say this is a little bit of a sketchy fight, I'm going to explain to you guys why. I think there's two different ways this fight can go. All right, Victor Hugo Silva, when I watch tape on him, he, he has these, these uh, kind of explosive uh, bursts at times, and he kind of fights like a sloppy fight, if you will. But, but it's not that he's necessarily lacking uh, for, from a skill standpoint, but you know those types of fighters that kind of just, they, they have a little bit of too much fun out there. They're throwing lazy kicks, and they're kind of playing around. And, uh, you know, if he goes that route and doesn't have a lot of success with his grappling, I could see Daniel Marcos... Uh, getting the better of the striking exchanges, just being more active and having more of that technical uh, stature that's going to look better for the judges' scorecards as he's throwing leg kicks. And I could see Daniel Marcos getting the better of the striking, okay? Um, but there's another X factor too because we need to bring up the performance that Daniel Marcos just had because I know uh, I'm very familiar with the fight, okay? I had it as an official play. I was at the bar. When I tell you guys... I was extremely pleased to hear the judge's decision. Uh, that's an understatement because I thought Davy Grant probably should have won the decision there. It was extremely close, but at the end of the day, I did feel that Grant probably edged that fight. So uh, Marcos was extremely disappointing in that fight because he was so inactive, okay? He was frozen in that fight. He was very frozen, and that's a little alarming to me because he, he never really was like that, too. When you think you take a look at the, the knockout he had over Simon Oliveira, uh, looked very good against Brandon Lewis, really pushed the pace, even though Brandon Lewis is not really on the level. Understand that against low-level. He was It was against a low-level opponent in Brandon Lewis, but still, then what he did to Simon Oliveira, I mean, he looked to be a, a very legitimate fighter in, in this division, but the Davy Grant fight, and I have a world of, of respect for Davy Grant, but the way Marcos froze up in that fight was alarming to me. Um, so again, though, Daniel Marcos potentially goes out here, you know, gets his wits back under him, picks up the activity, and will just be more technical and will outland Victor Hugo as Hugo has that that wild kind of like uh, you know lackadaisical approach. But he's also dangerous at times, throwing some explosive attacks. But I think. Victor Hugo Silva has a, a nasty ground game, okay? Not even just with the leg locks and whatnot. If he's able to close the distance and get those scrambles going on, he can get a submission uh, in a variety of ways. Um, you know, I know he doesn't have an overwhelming amount. Uh, uh, oh, you know what? I take that back. You know, this is an error here because, um, you know, you got 13. Yeah, it's they're not giving us all the method of victories. He has actually plenty, plenty of subs. I'm sorry here because it says four subs, but those are only of his recorded uh, victories of the 24, okay? Because you got 24 victories, but you only have uh, 7 plus 6. You got thir You only have 13 methods of victory here. So uh, you, got, you got another 11 fights that a, a vast majority of those were subs as well. And when you're watching them on tape, you understand he knows what he's doing down on the mat, okay? So, all right, you know, Teller pulling out some, some math on you guys, all right? But uh, so I, you know what? I am going to be going with Victor Hugo Silva here. I have a feeling that he's going to be one of the dogs uh, that, that starts barking on the night. You guys know there's always a couple dogs uh, that, that, that show up out of nowhere. You know, you're, you're, you're the mailman. You're walking up to drop off some mail, and that dog comes running around the corner. I think Victor Hugo Silva has the potential to be one of those fighters. He'll have the, the hometown edge. Uh, he's a plus 175 right now. Bovada opened as a plus 188. So action coming, coming his way a little bit here. Uh, He's actually now plus 180, so I just dipped back again, once again. Uh, very recent movement there. Uh, so, yeah, see, he is an underdog. He's almost a 2-1 to one underdog, but I think the value is on him, and I just have a feeling that he's going to sh show up. Uh, when you take into consideration Margos' hesitancy, I think that Victor will be very cocky and uh, will be out there uh, throw, throwing some strikes. I think he has enough success to take two rounds at least, or, or the X factor of him pulling off that submission check the sub props check the early the early finish props on the sub he might get a hold of uh he might get a hold of marcos there and pull off a sub early on as well in the lightweight division what a fight we have here elvis brenner taking on esteban rebovix both these fighters bring the fight this one's going to be a great great fight uh, of course what brenner did uh in his last uh, match was ridiculous uh, a huge underdog uh, against the uh the very dangerous and promising Guram uh, Kutlazi, uh, you know, went out there and knocked him out in the third round. Now he was down in the scorecards, but he was never out uh, mentally in that fight, continued to march forward, took so much damage. Uh, you see the two men here. I mean, you see the size of his head and maybe you have an understanding of, of why he could take so much damage. A very, 
very durable fighter. Uh, you know, training with, with Oliveira and all those boys over there at uh, Shuto Box. Those, those dudes just do not mess around. And I think Brenner is one of the real underrated fighters in the game. Okay, he, he got a decision victory over Zubara Tukigov. Um, I believe he took that fight on short notice as well. Another huge underdog there. You take a look at his losses. Lost to Gabriel Santos. We talked about him earlier. He's an absolute stud. Lost the decision to him. Um, a couple other uh, early losses in his career, but you have to understand he is just 26 years old and he is coming into his own right now. And I think by the time he's 29, 30 years old, he's going to be wreaking havoc in the UFC. I just think that the toughness he has, um, the striking is good. It's very good. Uh, obviously, he has a solid submission game as well. 10 submissions out of his 15 victories. He's very well-rounded and it's just going to give a lot of guys problems. I, I really believe that. So uh, I've been quite pleased with the two underdog performances that he's had. I have a lot of respect for Esteban Rebovic's. Um, you know, Esteban is another fighter that's kind of disrespected and comes in and shows up. Even uh, the the decision loss he had against uh, Loik uh, Rashkab Rashabov, uh, the fighter that came in um, from the PFL and and was highly respected. You, you took a look at the betting line and, and whatnot, but uh, Rebovic, you know, held his own in that fight, finished strongly. I think he won the third round there. Got another victory over Camilla Kirk after that, so or a bounce back with a victory after that. So. Uh, I think that Rebovic is a very talented fighter, great movement. Um, you know, he's very fluid with it, with his movement and whatnot. A very young and promising fighter. But I'm going to cut to the chase. I just think that Elvis Brenner uh, is going to be the fighter that digs a little deeper. And and as this fight starts to turn into a war, Rebovic will be hanging around. But but Brenner will land the bigger shots. He'll he'll, he'll eat Rebovic's shots. He'll come forward. He'll be the aggressor. And uh, yeah, I got to go with Elvis Brenner here. Uh, some other things I like too is that uh, Elvis Brenner will be, he'll, he'll be the larger fighter here. Uh, Brenner will have uh, about a three inch reach advantage, which I like there. Uh, and he'll have the much larger melon, right? The big old dome there. So uh, this one should be a good one, but I, I've definitely taken Brenner here. I've been very pleased with what I've seen from him. Now Bavada, he opened up as a minus 185 favorite and we see him go all the way down to a minus 145 favorite okay so the line closing if you like brenner this is probably a line you want to sit on and capitalize at the right time uh but that line movement really doesn't scare me i understand that he opened up a little high there uh but but i like elvis brenner anywhere from minus uh 160 and down i think that he, i have him capped right around minus 160 for this fight um again a lot of respect for reba Vicks, a very promising fighter but uh, brenner is the real deal kicking off the main card we have the older Bonfim brother and Ismail Bonfim who's coming off a very tough loss uh, where he was finished by Benoit St. Denis. He's now taking on Vince Pichel. Uh, Vince Pichel has been around forever, right? He, he was on the Ultimate Fighter a long time ago. He's 40 years old. Uh, looks like he should be you know, you know, out in the yard somewhere in California uh, scrapping in, in, in the prison system, but instead he's still scrapping in the cage and uh, much respect to him. He, he's tough as nails, man. Um, so again, Ismail Bonfim is the older uh, of the two Bonfim brothers. Um, you guys know I am higher on Gabriel Bonfim. I just want to make that clear real quick. Uh, Ismail Bonfim is a very talented fighter as well, but Gabriel is the brother that I, I really think has uh, a, a higher ceiling in my opinion. Now, in, in that last fight against Benoit St. Denis, you guys want to watch a fun fight, rerun the tape on that. From the second that fight kicked off, Benoit St. Denis was blasting uh, back back leg power kicks right to the body of Bonfim and Bonfim was waving him on saying bring more bring more trying to kind of psych him out intimidate him from continuing to do that and St. Denise just kept blasting those body kicks and uh, I mean the amount of force and, and power that he was putting into it it's no wonder why he broke down Bonfim in that fight Bonfim was uh, you know, out of place with his footwork as he was going in trying to throw these heavy shots and then St. Denise took him down and, and submitted him uh, but I think that Bonfim was hurt uh, pretty bad early on in that fight, and that, that's what eventually led to to him getting finished there. Um, it, uh, excuse me here. Um, you know, Ismail is a is a fighter uh, that has eight knockouts out of his nineteen uh, victories. The majority of his wins are via knockout, not by sub. Even though we know both of the brothers are well rounded fighters, Gabriel's been a little bit more proven with this submission game. Uh, you know, here's the thing. We'll cut to the chase here, man. Vince Michelle has only been knocked out once. Uh, out of his 17 pro fights. So if Bonfim doesn't land that knockout, uh, this fight could play out a little bit hairy. 
Um, also, you take into consideration Vince Michelle has been really putting in work. Even though he's 40 years old, he's still been putting in work. The only men uh, that, that recently defeated him, you know, dating all the way back to, uh, you know, you could even throw these guys in there too, man. Dating all the way back to uh, forever, okay? The, the, the only uh, guys that, that ever defeated him, they all have high caliber wrestling backgrounds. Mark Madsen has that Olympic uh, wrestling pedigree. You know, Gregor Gillespie, uh, one, one of the uh, nastiest wrestlers we've seen in, in the fight game. Rustin Kabilov with that Dagestani wrestling. Ally Kinta, obviously a, a decorated wrestler as well. That was a two-round fight on the Ultimate Fighter uh, back in the day. We know Ali, Ali Kinta uh, was a good fighter. Gave Khabib a run for his money. and um, when you take a look at, at, at that that list, there the only guys that were ever uh, able to defeat him, they, they have some high accolades, and uh, Ismail Bonfim has to prove more to us. He needs more. Uh, he needs those big victories under his belt before we really start to respect him. Uh, you know, of course, we understand that he had that big victory on um, on Dana White's Contender Series, uh, got the contract, and then he went out there and knocked out Terrence McKinney. But we also know that McKinney is prone to being knocked out at times. He has these big victories, but but in the past he's got a little bit reckless with his defensive skills and spent tagged. You know, give credit to Bonfim for for tagging him there, but I don't know if he gets Michelle out as easily in this fight. Uh, you know, eventually I think it plays out a little bit longer. Uh, that being said, I think that Ismail Bonfim will have that youth and that quickness and and uh, you know the energy from that last loss, the hungriness after taking that loss there. I think you mix it all together. Also fighting in Brazil, I think that that edges him to get the job done. But I'm actually going to say this fight uh, goes to a decision. And I'm going to say Ismail uh, edges out a, a decision victory. But I think that Vince Michelle will be game. Uh, but Vince Michelle is not a fighter that is easy to get out of there. So uh, I, I do think it's a decision victory there. We will, do a, we will go take a look at the betting line where you will see Ismail Bonfim is a huge favorite, man. Uh, he's a minus 450 on Bavada. No, no movement with that line yet. And that's pretty much uh, the type of line you're going to see all around. About a four and a half, one, excuse me, a four and a half to one favorite on Ismail Bonfim. Uh, I am not uh, crazy about that line personally. Again, I love the Bonfim brothers. I'm higher on Gabriel Bonfim. And I think that Vince Michelle is just an underrated fighter. And he's one of those types of dudes that even though he's 40 years old, uh, he, he has that, that Hendo uh the type of uh, thing going on, you know, thinking of D Dan Henderson as I just listened to him on, on the Rogan experience. But some of these fighters just age differently, man. They, they last much longer and they still put on those impressive performances. We saw Darren Elkins do it the other day. Um, I, I think that this is going to be a fun fight, but give me Ishmael Bonfim to win a decision. But with that line being a little too high for my liking, the value being on Vince Pichel, uh, which you can grab as high as a plus 350 which I, I think that there's some value there if you want to take a, a stab on an old dog. In the middleweight division, we have the always fun stylistic clash of a striker and grappler. Uh, Rodolfo Vieira, of course, being the grappler, the world-class Brazilian jiu-jitsu player, uh, taking on the silky, smooth striker in Armand Petrosian, uh, came into the sport of MMA with that kickboxing background. Both men uh, have almost identical records. Both men have tasted defeat twice, uh, almost the same amount of wins. Rodolfo Vieira with one more uh, fight under his belt, one more victory. Uh, but you know what? Armand Petrosian, and I want to talk about him here, had a huge knockout victory, a very quick knockout victory on Dana White's contender series uh, against a lower level opponent. But then he instantly comes into the UFC and gets a huge victory over a very respected opponent in Gregory Rodriguez uh, and, and a great fight. And Gregory, Gregory Rodriguez, I would argue to you, is a step above anybody on the hit list of Vieira's. Uh, you could argue Fluffy Hernandez, but I, I really have a lot of respect for Gregory Rodriguez there. Now, he did lose to Cayo uh, Bahayo after that, and that loss is a little bit alarming because he was consistently taken down in that fight. That, that's where Armin was showing a little bit of a chink in his armor with his takedown defense, although I really feel like he's been working on that, obviously. Uh, that, that's probably the main skill set that he's working on working on in the gym on a regular basis. Um, but if you want to look at that, that Cayo fight, uh, in a positive sense, at least he was taken down. It was never submitted in that fight. Uh, and then after that loss, he bounced back with two pretty good victories over AJ Dobson and CLD. Both those fighters uh, looking pretty good these days, even though CLD is coming off the loss. AJ Dobson just bounced back with the victory. And again, we know CLD is a talented fighter. So, um, you know, but, but to this stylistic clash here, I think it's pretty cut and dry. Armand Petrosian needs to keep this fight standing where he's going to have a clear path to victory 
uh, with his striking. I really expect him to get the better of Vieira there. Now, Vieira's striking is better than some of you guys uh, like to admit. Uh, he did stand and go toe to toe with Chris Curtis for for some time throughout that fight. Had some some success there, and this is a fighter that is just a uh, he's a world class athlete. That you know, a fighter that can uh, or you know an athlete that can use his mind to have as much success as he ha as, as he's had in the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu world. He can use that same mindset to uh, to have a lot of success in other elements of the fight game as well. You know, he could carry that into learning the striking game uh, more rapidly than some of these other guys out there. I, I truly believe that uh, he had a tough learning experience against uh, Anthony Hernandez, uh, where I, he gassed out very early on. But since that loss, I feel that he's worked very much so on his cardio and his conditioning. He's not carrying as much muscle, possibly. I don't know, but his conditioning looks better. Uh, so, so I don't think that that chink in his armor is, is there as much as it once was early in his MMA career. Um, but again, to the stylistic clash, I I'm picking Armand Petrosian to win this fight because I, I do believe that there is a, a much more likelihood that we see Petrosian dominate the striking compared to if Vieira is going the grappling route and maybe has a little success, you know, pushes Petrosian up against the cage, maybe gets a takedown, maybe Petrosian can hold on to the end of the round and survive, maybe, you know, maybe he also gets submitted, but I but I see a little bit more of a likelihood of Vieira just struggling to go for that that submission kill. I don't know if he consistently just gets takedowns for 15 minutes, and then in the process of trying to do that, Armand Petrosian is going to be landing strikes as Vieira is coming in, and you know the judges are scoring damage very much so these days, and Petrosian will be looking to inflict damage. And even if, say, he's uh, say he gets taken down for a minute or two in a round, Petrosian may land some significant damage. But you also have to take into consideration the crowd will be backing Vieira, uh, the Brazilian crowd. So th there's some mixed things going on here. But all in all, I just feel more confident backing uh, the clear path of victory of Armand Petrosian, getting the better of the striking on Vieira, and... Uh, maybe posing a threat offensively enough to to keep Vieira just from bombarding him with with the takedown and trying to get this fight down to the mat. Maybe he he throws some knees in the mix and whatnot, uses his footwork, and um, I'm gonna say that he actually gets a decision victory. Does Arma Petrosian, uh, Rodolfo Vieira? Uh, he was only uh, finished once in his career, and that was actually due to a submission, believe it or not. But remember now, that was a fight that he just absolutely gassed out in okay so uh i think his conditioning will be up to up to par <clears throat> he looked good against curtis in, in a barn burner type of fight and i think he can go to a decision here but petrosian will be a step ahead landing uh so some crisp strikes there this fight is uh, essentially a pick em. there's a minuscule lean uh, on petrosian here we'll open up uh my bookie he's now a minus 120 uh, open as a minus 126, dip to a minus 138. He was starting to trend as as a, a more of a favorite, but then the line goes back the other way. Um, I mean, essentially, this is a pick em fight. Let's just be clear about it. I like Armand Petrosian. I like to have that striking in my back pocket compared to the grappling. Uh, but if that's at, with that being said, there is a very realistic possibility that uh, Vieira can get some takedowns in this fight or can get a takedown even just one, and pull off a submission and end this fight. Staying put in the middleweight division, Kayo Bahayo takes on Abu Magomedov. Now, Magomedov uh, coming off that extremely disappointing loss. Uh, what a fight that was, right? Had some early success on Sean Strickland, uh, if you will, you know, landing, landing some kicks and whatnot. Sean Strickland just measuring him up uh, and eventually broke him down, finished him up. And that, that fight led... Uh, to Sean Strickland getting an opportunity to fight for the belt. So uh, what, what a victory that was there. But, you know, I feel that that fight definitely uh, exposed uh, Abu Magomedov. Uh, it, it definitely exposed him. I'm sorry. The way that he crashed with, with his cardio and the way that, that the, the spotlight hit him, uh, that was not a good look for him. You know, before that, he only had one fight in the octagon and had a very, very early knockout against Dustin Stolzfus, a lower-level fighter, a fighter that really shouldn't be in the UFC, if you ask me. He finished him within 19 seconds, so we never really got to see, uh, you know, what he what he uh, was about in the octagon. And I think the Sean Strickland fight really exposed him. And now, of course, Sean Strickland is a stud. He's a champion. But it's just the way that he did it, man. It's the way that... Uh, excuse me, it's the way Magomedov looked as, as he crashed in that fight, and, and I just don't trust him. And you want to talk about how good Sean Strickland is. Well, guess what? Uh, Kyle is an absolute stud as well. 
and I think that his pressure is going to be a lot for, for Megamedov to deal with. Now, Megamedov uh, may be dangerous early on, as we've seen before. Uh, he puts a lot into his strikes early on. He might try to uh, land that knockout, or I expect him to try to land that knockout early. But if he doesn't get the finish, what's going to happen when Kyle's using beautiful footwork, he's measuring him up perfectly, landing his own fluid shots in the feet, but eventually goes to the grappling and probably breaks uh, Megamedov down on the mat, probably gets a TKO or possibly sets up a sub. Uh, I, I, I'm i taking Kyle Bahio to get the job done here via finish. It's kind of hard for me to pinpoint whether it's going to be a sub or, or a TKO. Or, uh, I'm not really expecting a flash KO. I'm thinking more of like a ground and pound type of finish where Megamedov quits in the cage. Um, I'll lean more towards a TKO. I'm going to say that, that, that Kyle gets this fight down to the mat and uh, Megamedov's breathing heavily and maybe looks for a way out. You know, I still want to say maybe a rear naked choke as well, but uh, I'm going to go with TKO. Uh, but Bahayo uh, does get the job done. The natural, uh, the leader of the fighting nerds. Uh, I'm going to say he gets the job done here. And um, also note, you know, we have re we really haven't seen Megamedov's takedown defense tested. I don't believe anyone shot on him so far in the UFC, so we'll see how that holds up, especially in the second round and the third round. I, I could see him uh, going down to the mat, and I could see him <clears throat> kind of uh, falling apart in there, down on the mat, the same way he falls apart up on the feet. So, uh, But he will be dangerous early on. He'll be throwing some some heavy strikes, but uh, Kyle is uh, he has a very high fighter IQ, and he's very defensively sound. Uh, you take a look at this as well. I mean, look at uh, the amount of strikes that have been landed on him in the, in the octagon, only 1.86. Um, now, he's not putting out a great amount of output, a lot of control time mixed in his fights, only landing 2.59, where, where uh, Zmegamedov has landed more per minute. But those numbers are kind of skewed in the way his fights played out. Uh, but look how many he's absorbed also. That's another skewed number due to the Sean Strickland fight. But, but being landed on with 8.39 strikes per minute, the thing I want you to notice, though, is just the 1.86 that the Kyle is very defensively sound. He avoids that big shot and uh, just breaks Mega Medov down and, and, and finishes him. Okay, so <clears throat> let's go take a look at the betting line here. Uh, Kyle is a big favorite. He's a minus 310 favorite. He opened as a minus 380, though, on Jazz Sports. So the line going the other way, people putting some respect on Mega Medov's lane, uh, name at least a little bit. Uh, we will take a look at my bookie. Where Kyle opened as a minus 370 and is now minus 323. So the line trending the other way, which is good if you're a Kyle uh, fan, if you're looking to bet him here. Which I would be more so on the Kyle side, even with the high line. I don't see any value on Megamedov. I don't trust him. And uh, I'm looking to take Kyle here and I'm looking to take him via finish. Or I'm parlaying him if the line continues to trend down. If you can get him in the, the upper minus 200s, that would be great. Up in the heavyweight division, we got a rematch. Uh, if you guys forgot here, Rodrigo Nascimento has a submission victory over Dante Mays already. Uh, but we have a rematch now. And I think this is a little bit of a different matchup. A little bit. Uh, obviously, Dante Mays has had a lot more time to polish up his grappling and his uh, defensive jiu-jitsu skills and whatnot. Uh, you know, As I'm filming this uh, today, uh, it was the day that John Jones announced that he had to pull out of his fight with Stipe Miocic. He was actually working on his, his grappling and, and uh, his wrestling with Dantel Mays. They were scrambling around together. And uh, Dantel Mays uh, was, uh, I don't know if you want to say he's the man that injured John Jones. But the point I'm making is, is that Dantel Mays has been getting in uh, grappling sessions and training sessions in uh, with one of the goats of the game. So that's obviously a feather he has in his cap going into this matchup. He's going to be a sharper version of himself. Uh, he's coming off a very big win where he went out there and knocked out Andre Arlovsky. Um, I say a very big win. I mean, he showed up, he got the job done. You understand though, Andre Arlovsky is an aged fighter and, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a product of that as well. Uh, lost to Augusto Sakai before that. And Augusto Sakai, it reminds me a little bit of Nacho Mento from the striking uh, standpoint. Um, but Nacho Mento, a, a more polished jujitsu player, uh, I would say. And again, we, we saw that when they faced off for the first time where he pulled off that second round submission. Um, some of the bigger victories, Dante Mays has had, you know, over Josh Parisian and, and Roque Martinez. Roque Martinez, one third the size of him. Josh Parisian, I've never been high on. Um, you know, I, I may sound like I'm being a little uh, harsh on Dante Mays, you know, victory over Muhammad Usman back in the day. Just uh, guys that have raw abilities, but just are not really that polished. And I still believe Dante Mays is probably an unpolished stone. Maybe 
By the time he's 33, 34, he, he could be a little bit more of a respectable fighter. He has that big power, can knock you out. He's a little lethargic and slow with, with his striking at times, though. Uh, an 81-inch wingspan. Uh, he's a tall dude. He's a big dude. And uh, if Rodrigo Nascimento can avoid that big shot, I think that he could uh, you know, hang, close the distance, and, and try to get this fight down to the mat where I think he'll just be a little bit more of the polished grappler. Uh, we'll see, though, if the training that Dante Mace has been getting in with John Jones uh, has him ready for that task and uh, he can create distance and look to land a big shot. Let's not forget Rodrigo Nascimento was knocked out uh, by Chris Dawkins, a fighter that has decent boxing skills, but really was never never really able to replicate that again consistently uh, since, since that time in, in uh, 2020 there. Um, you know, uh, also note, this was a, a, a no contest. It was overturned to a no contest, but Rodrigo Nascimento finished Alan Budat, a kickboxer, finished him up against the cage. Uh, he got uh, popped for a banned substance, but, and then we had two split decision victories where he edged out Tanner Bozier. Bozier, you know, up and down, and then uh, a split decision victory over an aged Ilir Latifi. But Latifi, sometimes he shows up, so I don't know. This is a little bit of a funky fight, the rematch here. Uh, this one's a little bit random on the card, but uh, it'll probably end up being a fun fight. I'll take Rodrigo Nascimento to get the job done again. He did it uh, before, and I think he's just the more polished fighter. And I think the grappling and jiu-jitsu will come into play. And he's also pretty quick on the feet as well. But I think he'll use that quickness and footwork to close the distance. I think he should look to get this fight down to the mat and test the BJJ of uh, Mays once again. Um, you know, Hemdi uh, Habdullah, whatever his name was, that wrestler, the Egyptian wrestler, I believe Egyptian, he had some success with his grappling on Dantel Mays as well. I would like to see Rodrigo go that route. Uh, I don't want him slugging it out with Dantel Mays because Mays can knock you out. Uh, Rodrigo Nascimento is a 2-1 to one favorite, open as a 227 on Jazz Sports. He's now a 210, the line uh, trajecting uh, towards Mays' way. Let's take a look my on my bookie. Uh, Nascimento opened as a minus 250 and is now a 222. So same thing. We're seeing the consistent movement towards Mays' way. Uh, keep an eye on, the, on that line there. If you like Nascimento, the line's only going to get better. Obviously, if you like Mays, you want to jump on that. But, uh, uh, you know, if you're taking Mays, you definitely want to try to you would have wanted to try to grab that nice and early and really try to get some some solid dog value. Maybe a 183 line, a 190 line would be worth the stab potentially for you guys that like those dog type of odds. Uh, you're also maybe looking at the knockout prop. Uh, Maze does carry some serious power. If he's going to get the job done, he's probably going to need to land a big shot to shake things up. I, I think you want to look at those types of props there. Uh, if you're looking to take Maze, look for that knockout prop or you know um, maybe the under. I think he needs to shake something up early on in this fight. In the welterweight division, we have the young stud, uh, the highly touted prospect, Gabriel Bonfim. Uh, he's taking on Nicholas Dalby here. What a stage this is for him. We talked about it early on uh, in the episode here about uh, the UFC looking for some of these young Brazilian stars to really burst on the scene uh, on this card and have a really impactful win. Gabriel Bonfim is a fighter that you're going to want to look towards to, to see if he can have that moment because I think the future is so bright for him. He's 26 years old, 15-0, and 0, has nasty submission skills. Uh, I mean, if you remember what he just went out there and did uh, to Trevin Giles, Trevin Giles is no slouch, okay? Uh, understand that right now. Trevin Giles is a stud, went out there and submitted him in, in just over a minute, um, submitted Manure Lezez in under a minute, uh, you had the submission victory over Trey Waters on Dana White's Contender Series. Note, Trey Waters went on to have two big victories uh, since that loss there, including a, a very big victory uh, in his last fight uh, over Josh Quinlan. Uh, Josh Quinlan, if you if you guys know about Josh Quinlan, he's a stud in the game right now too, I believe, giving Josh his first ever loss. Um, so just understand, Gabriel Bonfim doing his thing right now. Needs to string off some some big victories here. Nicholas Dalby is a very respected name in the game. He's been around for a long time. You know how how Dalby fights, constant movement, all that herky jerky stuff. You know, looking to score points uh, from from range and whatnot. But occasionally, will throw some big shots towards your way if if you're lacking defensively. He can clip you. Uh, has some decent grappling skills. Very physically fit. Uh, but if this fight goes to the mat, I am. Uh, I'm being very clear that Bonfim is is going to have a major advantage there, and I think he could he could easily lock up a submission. I would love to see him try to get this fight down to the mat. I don't want him just playing playing a striking game. Although in the striking department, I think that he'll more than hold his own, and I think that he'll get the better of uh, you know of his opponent there as well. And, and Dalby, um, 
remember now, he is the younger brother by a year. Uh, he also fights in the welterweight division compared to his brother, Ishmael, who fights in the lightweight division. We talked about him earlier. Uh, Gabriel is just a stud, though. I, I just, you know, I, I from the tape I was breaking down uh, when both these fighters were fighting on Dana White's contender series back then, it's just Gabriel's the one that stood out to me, and I thought his performance stood out to me a little bit more so as well. Uh, it's just the, the, the danger he brings to the table with his grappling, and uh, he's a sharp striker as well, whereas his brother kind of headhunts a little bit more so. And uh, I'm not always fond about those types of fighters. They're fun to watch, but uh, sometimes in the big situations, you know, they don't land that big shot and they start to break a little bit and fade with their ta their gas tank and whatnot. Um, so, you know, where are we going with this fight? You know, let me cut to the chase. I think that Gabriel Bonfim uh, is going to be the first ever man to finish Nicholas Dalby. Nicholas Dalby has never been finished. You look at his four losses. They're all via decision. I say Gabriel Bonfim. Uh, adds another submission victory to his resume. He already has 11 subs uh, out of his 15 victories, one KO. Uh, but don't get it twisted. Uh, Gabriel's been uh, he's been training MMA for a long time. His striking is coming around, and it, it's there as well. He's very fluid, uh, and as I should say for his brother too. But uh, Gabriel is very fluid, mixing in his striking and grappling. It's just the grappling and submission uh, skill set that he has is is definitely uh, that that's his main. Uh, tool there so uh give me gabriel bonfim to pull off the sub and i'll say an early sub as well an earlier sub a first round maybe a second round but a first round sub that that's the route i'm going there and um let's take a look at the betting line he's a minus 476 on my bookie open up as a minus 344 action heavily coming in on gabriel bonfim uh, on bet online he opened as a minus 550 and uh, went up to a 350, or excuse me, went down, action coming in on coming in on Dalby, and now he's back to a minus 525, action coming back in on him. So people are saying, oh, sh I fucked up, you know, the line correcting itself, saying, oh, no, it, it should be in the, fi the minus 500 range. Now, I do believe that that's a little bit of a high line. I mean, uh, Ambavada, he opened as a 350, he's now 500, I mean, a 5-1 to one favorite. Um, if he's not able to get this fight down to the mat and this fight plays out, uh, for the long haul, if this fight goes into the third round, we know that Dalby is a fighter that has proven uh, late in fights. He has a great gas tank. He's always doing the funky breathing techniques, but he has a good gas tank. And on the other hand, let's take a quick look. Let, let's circle back. Uh, Gabriel Bonfim uh, finishing his last four fights all in the first round. Uh, you got to go all the way back to uh, 2021 where he uh, knocked out uh, Brenner Alberth, but that was uh, in the middle of the third round. And then again, first round, second round, a third there, and then first, first, first. A lot of early victories on his career. And you have to understand that uh, he's never been deep into a fight with a UFC caliber fighter like a Nicholas Dalby. So that's the X factor there. Not crazy about throwing him in a parlay or whatnot. I think you're trying to look for a sharp line on him, maybe for a sub or an early finish. But, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a riskier task as well. I'll be sitting back. You know, I'll be clear with you guys. I'll probably be sitting back just enjoying this fight, uh, rooting on Gabriel Bonfim, as I, I hope for him to be uh, one of the bright, bright stars in the game representing uh, Brazil. Here we go. We're at the main event. We got Jelton Almeida, the number ninth ranked heavyweight, taking on the number 10th ranked heavyweight in Derek Lewis. Uh, we, we have to mention uh, that this is... I mean, I'm, I'm buying in. I believe this is a different version of Derek Lewis. There's different versions that show up. He struggles a little bit with his motivation or maybe his diet and whatnot. Uh, I mean, the, the Derek Lewis that we just saw uh, go out there and steamroll Marcos Rogerio de Lima, that was that was crazy, man, okay? And now Marcos Rogerio de Lima obviously is not Jelton Almeida, and, and he's shown to be a little bit mentally strange at times in the cage. He's, he's, he's a good fighter. Let, let me not be too harsh on him. But he's not a gelatin Almeida. Again, I want to say that very clearly. But it doesn't matter. I mean, I mean, when Derek Lewis shows up and he he's that form, if he comes and tries to bombard Jelton Almeida right from the moment that bell rings, if he is able to tee off one of his big shots, it will put out anybody on planet Earth, all right? You guys know that. It will literally... I think he can knock out a rhinoceros if he lands... You know, uh, on the right spot. It's it's Derek Lewis, man, the Black Beast. He's an absolute stud. But we saw him in his last fight looking more trim. I'm I'm excited and interested to see how he looks on the scales uh, going into this fight. And, uh, you know, I, I'm hoping, and I do believe that he will come in looking similarly to how he looked for the last fight. I think he's, he's going to carry... Uh, the momentum and the motivation from that last fight and try to make a run at this title one more time. I think he's he's all in. Um, 
you know, but it is worth noting that, you know, before that victory, he was he was having a little bit of a tough run. And that Sergey Spivak submission loss looks really bad right now because Spivak looked like crap in his last fight. And the way that Lewis was just going out there, you know, got knocked out by Tai Tuivasa. The, the Sergey Pavlovich fight doesn't look bad at all because he's an animal. But uh, the Spivak loss doesn't look that good. The Tuivasa loss doesn't look that good. Um, you know, those are the ones that kind of stand out a little bit. He was on a little bit of a tough streak. And uh, listen, Jelton Almeida... You know, he's going to look to close the distance and you know what he's going to do. He's going to look to get in on the hips of, of Lewis. He's going to look to get him down to the mat. And it's kind of hard for, for me to sit here and say I don't foresee that happening because um, Jalton Almeida is just really good at doing that. We saw what he just did at Jarzino Rosenstruck, uh, getting him down to the mat, submitting him there, uh, and just going out there, finishing all these guys down to the mat, man. Uh, he, he just, anyone that's been in there with him, he gets a hold of them and he dominates them down on the mat. And even when you think about, uh, you know, the, the contender series fight that he had against uh, Nazaruddin Nazaruddinov, that was a fight people were kind of interested uh, about the Dagestani fighter there, and Almeida just took all that steam, dominated him down in the mat. Uh, he is a a men amongst men, uh, but it is worth noting that uh, you know Derek Lewis is a a giant man, and uh, he's a legit heavyweight fighter, and uh, not what. Uh, Jarzinho, excuse me here, Jarzinho, or excuse me, Jelton Almeida has now had uh, a couple fights, uh, you know, up in the heavyweight division now. Because uh, remember, he he also ha had some fights at lower weight classes in the light heavyweight division, right? So he's now up in the heavyweight division. He's really solidifying himself um, as a major threat in the heavyweight division. So let me not ramble on too much. Um, I am taking Jel uh, Jelton Almeida here. Excuse me if I was mixing in Jarzino Rosenstruck's name with Jelton Almeida. They kind of sim or they sound similar to me for some reason, the J and whatnot. But uh Jelton Almeida, I, I think he's gonna get this fight down to the mat. And I think eventually he's gonna break Derek Lewis and he's gonna submit him. Uh of course, it's a five-round fight. It's a main event. I don't think Derek Lewis uh is gonna survive this fight. So uh, if you want to look at prop bets for this fight, not to go the distance or the unders, um, I think that that's a, a route that you might want to go. Um, again, you, you know, you know, the deal with Derek Lewis, man, if he's not getting that knockout, man, he, he'll start to just cave in. And I could even see Jelton Almeida maybe landing some big shots at him in the third or fourth round where or Lewis will still throw some heavy shots towards his way, but he'll kind of be breathing heavily and he'll gas out and he will be finished. So Jelton Almeida, uh, I'm going to take him via second round finish. And, uh, you take a look at the money line. He opened as a minus 550 on Bavada. He's now a minus 450. Uh, I'm, I'm not really crazy about even mixing him up in a parlay because Derek Lewis looks looks dangerous right now. He's always looked dangerous, but this version of him, it's the heavyweight division. It only takes one shot. So uh, be careful parlaying that. Uh, maybe you're looking for a submission. Uh, on Jelton Almeida, maybe you get a nice prop line, but make sure the line is worth it. Um, either way, this is going to be a fun fight. Cannot wait for it. All right, guys, that's going to wrap up UFC Brazil. I hope you guys found this video uh, beneficial to you guys of course we have the timestamps for members so you could always jump back to any specific fights that you want to hear about uh, extensively as you're, you're making your mind up what you're looking to bet or whatnot and uh, i feel good about our spots for this card if you're looking to work with me of course reach out to me uh, i'm definitely gonna make i'm definitely gonna make this a profitable event i feel good about that all right guys so uh throw some closing uh, thoughts towards your guys way nothing deep just some nonsense uh, as it's getting late over here and i've been rambling for a while um, you know, I, just, I found this interesting. Isn't it interesting? Uh, the other day I was in the sauna and these two dudes were in there. They were a little out of shape, but props to them for making it to the gym. But, uh, you know, they were kind of rambling about, uh, you could just tell they didn't really, they don't really frequent the gym that often. He was kind of complaining about going to the gym. It was a little much for him, this and that, whatever. And I'm sitting there listening to that. And I'm thinking about how, like, don't get me wrong, I haven't been how I used to be going to the gym all the time, but I, I love going to the gym and I could do it nonstop. I can go there for hours uh, every day. I really enjoy it. It's my fun, my my fun, uh, my my fun place, whatever you want to say, right? But then I'm listening to some them talk about these things they're doing with their business, and uh, you know, he's like, oh yeah, I did this in the morning. I drove out to there, and then I did do here, and then I flew here, and they're saying all that, this type of stuff. And that absolutely exhausts me. And I just found it interesting how some people can, can put like the worst fuel in their body. They don't eat good. If I don't eat good, man, I feel like crap. I, you know, uh, don't get me wrong. I'll eat some stuff here and there. Obviously, even you guys see me, but I'm in decent shape. I don't, don't make me pull the shirt off, but I could sharpen some things up. But if I eat a little crappy here and there, I feel like dog shit. 
And, uh, you know, I, I don't know, maybe I'm a lazy dude, but I can't be driving here, flying here, just busting my butt the way these guys talk about it. But I find it interesting. Some people are built differently. They're built for different things, right? Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe you could kind of try to work on things and change things. But at the end of the day, maybe it's from your childhood, just how you were, it's your genetics. Because I know people like that have friends like that. And some people, they struggle to do certain things that I, we or you might do so easily, but there's other things that are fun or just natural to them that come so hard for me or you you know what i'm saying it's just i found that interesting as you know you you listen to a dude that's like fat and out of shape and just eating junk food and drinking sodas and just goes non-stop that work mentality but personally i don't think that's really you know every each his own man but that ain't really my my route i don't think that's the best route to a healthy long life but i know work is fun and good for some people but working too much and not taking care of your body although it's that might be your thing you know, you might want to balance yourself with taking care of yourself and not over stressing yourself out. But I don't know. You know just a teller sitting on the mic late Wednesday night. Uh, I don't think I'll be able to edit this tonight, guys. It's, uh, it's 1 a.m. here now. I'm going to wake up first thing in the morning, Thursday morning. I'll edit this video, get it up to you guys. And uh, I appreciate all you guys. All right. On that note, signing out. Teller. Welcome to the show, this is the MMA fortune teller. Yeah. The MMA fortune teller. The teller. The teller. The teller.